If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. We have a special show today. I've got a special guest with me. In fact, uh, I don't. I won't even wa waste any more time here. I'll introduce you right now. Rob Zins, good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. You're with an organization. It's got a very interesting name. Would you care to uh, mention that organization and tell us uh, just a little bit about it? Well, I'm involved with an organization, and it does have an interesting name, Larry. It's entitled Christians Evangelizing Catholics. And the reason that name was chosen is because uh, this organization is very concerned to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Catholic community and to help explain the differences between biblical Christianity and the Roman Catholic religion. My home base is in Vermont, so I'm down here from the great northeast, and I bring you greetings from the Christians in New England. All right. It's, it's great to have you down here. Thank you. Thank you. How's your uh, stay been in Texas so far? It's been hot and humid. <laughs> I spent last weekend in Houston, and uh, I came down here for sunshine, and I found rain. But uh, <laughs> there's nothing warmer than the people of the state of Texas, and I enjoy being here immensely. Oh, that's great, and uh, we'll be glad to have you back any time. Thank uh, you. As you come back through our big state, if you can ever get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we're talking today about something, as you just heard Rob mention, uh, the name of his organization called Christians Evangelizing Catholics. Now, isn't that startling? Now, you know, anyone out there watching Dayspring Evangelism, we never talk about anything controversial on this show. Why, we, we, we believe in just saying nice things about everybody. Well, anyway, if, uh, if you have known our show, then you know uh, that's not true either. <laughs> but uh, but uh, to get back to the serious side of things, uh, we're, we're going to talk about a very serious subject right now. We're going to talk about something that uh, many people, I think, are confused about, to say the least. Uh, I think a lot of Christians out there believe that the uh, Roman Catholics and the Roman Catholic Church is just kind of uh, a mixed-up Christian church. Kind of, they're Christians, but they're just a little strange in what they do. Uh, well, I think you're absolutely right, Larry. We've talked with many Christians and evangelical churches, and they are fond of saying that they have found that there are mixed up Methodists and perhaps mis mixed up Presbyterians or mixed up Bible church people and why not say that the Roman Catholic religion is just another example of uh, one other Christian denomination that may have a peculiar point of view on one or two things but basically we must include the Catholic religion within the family of God and that's the danger and that's what I hope to get into a little bit more as we discuss the issue today. Right now as you speak and it seems startling I'm sure to a lot of our viewers out there as you speak you are basically saying Roman Catholics are not Christians and the Roman Catholic Church is not a Christian church. Well that's right uh, basically I'm saying that the Roman Catholic religion is not a Christian religion per se because it does mm -hmm. not teach or preach or deliver the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It does take the names that Christians are familiar with, God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. They do believe in certain aspects of the Christian faith that we would hold also. But all in all, as an organization, as an entity, as a religious entity, the Roman Catholic religion does not pass the test or the muster when it comes to taking the name Christianity. And I know that that sounds offensive to some of you who may be out there who are Roman Catholics and who attend Mass faithfully and have relied upon your religion to draw you closer to God. 
but at the same time I must be firm and say that the ingredients of the Roman Catholic religious system is contrary to the simple teachings of the Bible. Now this is not to say that all Roman Catholics are unsaved or non-believers. There are Roman Catholics who are saved by the grace of God and we believe that as they grow in the truth that's found in Scripture that they'll eventually leave the Roman Catholic religion and find their way to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. So I want to make a differentiation right off the bat between Roman Catholicism as a religious system and the Roman Catholics who may in fact have come to Christ despite the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. I think it's a very important distinction. Now, I want to get this out right away. Do you bear some kind of animosity towards Roman Catholics? Is there some kind of hatred? I've been at UT campus before and I've seen people handing out hate tracts against the, the, the Roman Catholic Pope, you know, saying he's the Antichrist. And I've seen them out there debating uh, Roman Catholic students and it was a hateful, spiteful type of atmosphere. Are you coming here with some kind of spiritual chip on your shoulder against Catholics or is there a concern that you have here? No, there, we're not uh, involved in that type of ministry. Our ministry is, is really threefold. It's, it's educational. It's to bring to the surface the differences between biblical Christianity and the Roman Catholic religion. It's also, by way of apologetics, this ministry is involved in earnest and serious debate, dialogue, and discussion with Roman Catholic scholars. And because of that, I spend a lot of time preparing to debate the Roman Catholic uh, scholars and university professors and things of this nature. We have a heart for those who are involved in the Roman Catholic Church. We have a heart in the sense that we think that Roman Catholics are very serious about their faith. They're very serious about the idea of God and the idea of Jesus Christ. But they have been misled by their system. And as a result, it's a ministry of clarification it's also a ministry of protection, too, I must be honest with you. We believe that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be compromised in any way. And in order to show forth the jewel of the gospel, so to speak, we must compare it with religions and organizations that fall short of the gospel. And uh, this is our goal, and this is our purpose, and it's our desire. We are not looking to, uh, to hurt anybody or to run a hate campaign or anything like this. The idea is to try to help the Roman Catholic better understand his or her own religion and then present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of it. So that's our goal and our desire. I see, and you mentioned something about debates. Uh, after the material is presented in our shows, uh, would you be open in case any Roman Catholic scholar out there might be interested in debating you at some time on television, perhaps? Well, I would be. As a matter of fact, we have uh, had an opportunity to take part in some debates already. I have mm -hmm. not uh, been the main speaker at a debate yet, but I think my time is coming. I've been scheduled for some time this summer, and Lord willing, I will be debating a Roman Catholic scholar in the San Diego area, and the subject of the debate will be justification by faith alone and also the mass. Now this debate will be done in, in two nights at a large Roman Catholic church in the San Diego area and uh, anybody who's interested in, in debating or, or attending a debate of this nature can contact me at my office or just write me and I'll make sure that they get all the information. Okay, so you're not coming on here and doing a hit and run campaign. You are actually offering an opportunity for people that disagree with you to meet you in debate at yeah. some, you know, after the arrangements, arrangements are made and all that kind of Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Our whole focus is educational dialogue and we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I think we have a very good understanding of the Roman Catholic religion. And Larry, it might surprise you to know that by far the large majority of Roman Catholic people that we talk to do not really understand their own religion. And this is why in uh, presentation of this nature if we're on television or in a debate we always go to the highest sources possible 
in the Roman Catholic religion. So today, for instance, we'll be quoting from the Council of Trent and mm -hmm. from the highest possible religious sources within Rome because we want the ministry to be uh, straightforward, clear-cut, open, so people can see exactly what we're involved with. And this reminds me of some of the charges I've heard made by some evangelical Christian uh, organizations that say, well, people that do what they call Roman Catholic bashing or Catholic bashing, they, their, their work is shoddy, unscholarly, things of this nature. And uh, what you just said is that we're going to go to some of the actual quotes of the Roman Catholic Church itself and their higher authorities. Mm -hmm. It's not just some shoddy uh, uh, research, you might say. I guess this brings to mind, uh, let's say, chick publications. If there's viewers out there that have seen these chick tracks, as they're called, uh, from I think it's uh, Jack Chick Publications, puts out a magazine called uh, Alberto, or a comic book, Alberto, and he's got a host of other comics and stuff uh, just attacking a Roman Catholic church. Uh, I brought an example here. There's a lot of books out on Catholicism. Here's one. The Two Babylons by uh, uh, Hislop, I think, Alexander Hislop. And he supposedly ties us into uh, ancient Babylon and all this stuff. But there's some bad research in here. And this gives, I guess, Roman Catholic apologists a straw man to shoot at. When, uh, when, they, when some bad research is done, then they can come on and shoot, shoot at the straw man of the, of the bad research instead of really dealing with the main issues that we want to touch on. Uh, there's a number of... Uh, uh, I think bad books out there for Christians they you should just stay stay away from them because they're not really going to get you the kind of information you want books I would recommend as long as we're on the subject is uh, this one here James R. White's book The Fatal Flaw and of course subtitled Do the Teachings of Roman Catholicism Deny the Gospel it's put out by Crown Publications and uh, have you had a chance to read this book by any chance? Yes, I have. I know James White, and he has done a fine job in this book, and, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. One of the problems that we have in evangelizing the Roman Catholic community and uh, debating the Roman Catholic scholars is that there has been so much material put out by well-meaning Protestants or evangelicals, but their research has been shabby and their source material has been suspect. And oftentimes, uh, we don't take the time to research correctly the Roman Catholic religion and their position theologically on things. Mm -hmm. And uh, many evangelicals have been guilty of taking a, a popular approach to uh, Roman Catholic bashing, as you said. Mm -hmm. But uh, we want to avoid this. Uh, the Roman Catholic religion has published uh, enough to fill many libraries on what they believe, exactly how their religion is formed, the basis of all their practices and beliefs, so we can go right to the source, right to the authority. We don't need to popularize and uh, bring into play some of this more uh, dramatic, speculative type reasoning. We can mm -hmm. simply go to the Roman Catholic scholars and say, tell us what is your gospel? What do you believe about the Lord Jesus Christ? What do you believe about the church? What do you believe about salvation, justification, redemption, mm -hmm. eternal security? What do you believe about Mary? So forth mm -hmm. and so on, purgatory and these issues. And as this comes forward, I think that uh, the difference between the two will be clearly delineated without the mudslinging and without the poor scholarship. Right. So yes, I would endorse uh, Jim's book because he does just that. And speaking of that, he's got another one also called Answers to Catholic Claims. And, uh, you know, a discussion of biblical authority, also available from Crown Publications. And uh, if people out there need more information on these books, they can always call Dayspring Evangelism and we'll get the information over to them if they aren't able to track this down themselves. But uh, James does a fine job in here answering some of the Roman Catholic apologists even. Uh, I think Carl Keating is one of them and uh, a few of the other ones that are out there for Catholic answers, as right. they say. I guess uh, the opposite of what we're doing here. <laughs> right. but, now, uh, we should probably mention that the Roman Catholic Church is not sitting back idly watching the uh, world unfold as far as religion is concerned. 
They have become very aggressive in their claims to be the one and only true church and to have formulated a religion or a doctrine which in, in their understanding represents the Bible, God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of their leading spokesmen is Carl Keating who represents a group uh, from Southern California entitled Catholic Answers and he has written extensively and we're familiar with uh, Carl's writings, appreciate them. We think that he has well represented the Roman Catholic position on a number of theological issues and it's this type of scholarship that we wish to respond to as we go around the country and forming evangelicals and Catholics of the differences between the two religions. Very well said. As long, just to finish off some of these books I brought with me, here's another, uh, I found this to be an excellent resource book. It's called Roman Catholicism, Issues and Evidences by Richard Knowles. Uh, just packed with great information on Roman Catholicism from the actual source materials of the Roman Catholic Church uh, and references. And I, I highly recommend this book for someone that really wants to dive into extensive research. He's got a very good uh, bibliography in the back also for further research. And uh, one other thing I wanted to touch on as long as we were discussing it, uh, there are, we did mention that there's some uh, evangelical organizations that are saying that anyone that, that throws the Roman Catholic Church in with the, uh, is anyone that's watched Day Spring Evangelism is uh, aware of, we, we deal extensively with the cults. And of course, uh, anyone, they say anyone would stick the Roman Catholic Church in with the cults. Uh, you know, shoddy research, all, all that we've already covered. Well, I just wanted to say on this, I, I did bring uh, some of uh, here Calvin's Institutes. I think almost the whole second volume here is on Roman Catholicism, and uh, some of the things he says aren't too kind, and I don't think anyone said that uh, Calvin wasn't a, maybe a scholar of the first rank. Uh, I think uh, he's, he's maybe made a name for himself in church history. We can add to that Martin Luther, mm -hmm. Zwingli, mm -hmm. uh, Hooper. Or, uh, there's just a number of the great reformers in church history mm -hmm. that have all said the same thing mm -hmm. uh, about the Roman Catholic Church. And so I find it kind of amusing myself that t these, these kind of uh, interesting attacks uh, against anyone that would put the Roman Catholic Church outside of the Christian family mm -hmm. is suddenly you know, not much of a, a theologian or anything else. So uh, I wanted to bring that out just for our viewers, you know, to get a, get a shot think, in there. I think that's a good point. And perhaps this would be a lesson for our evangelical brothers and sisters. We have had an opportunity to go to churches and to, to uh, request entry to give a seminar or to give a teaching or to show a videotape. And we have found that there has been resistance among evangelical mm -hmm. churches. And one of the reasons given to us is the unwillingness to rock the boat when it comes to relations with the Roman Catholic religion. And uh, this grieves me and it, it gives me some concern because every single evangelical church in America, worldwide for that matter, owes a great debt to the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation founded, it can be said, the theology upon which every single Bible church, community church, fellowship church, Baptist church, Lutheran church, <laughs> Methodist church, Episcopal church, so forth and so on. All of their theology rests upon the wisdom, the light that came from the great Protestant Reformation. And to think that uh, in today's age there would be a worry or a concern or a doubt or a fear of exploring the Roman Catholic claims, the Roman Catholic religion within the confines of evangelicalism is uh, somewhat scary and it perturbs me. So I would encourage uh, those of you who will view this video to talk with your pastors or your teachers or your elders, uh, people of authority in your churches, and perhaps question them as to the roots or foundations of their very religion that uh, all of you are involved in on a, on a daily basis and uh, find that the roots go deep into the Protestant Reformation and uh, the Reformation was a battle between the uh, reformers and the Roman Catholic religion over the issue of sola scriptura and sola fide, Bible alone and faith alone for salvation. Now these issues haven't changed. And so I would encourage you to uh, re-examine your moorings, your foundations, and your roots 
to uh, better equip yourself to defend the faith once delivered to the saints. Now, this wasn't just a minor issue back then in Reformation history oh, either. My, no. Wasn't there a uh, 30 years war that took place where uh, once the Reform Reformation started, the whole countries converted over to Protestantism, and then uh, later on uh, a war broke out where the Roman Catholic Church sent armies into countries like uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, which had mainly converted to Protestantism, but their armies conquered and forced them, I guess, at sword point <laughs> to convert back to Catholicism or else uh, die or leave. I think right. it was the, Well, this is the great uh, Catholic counter-reformation. After the outbreak of the Reformation, which was ignited by Martin Luther and his 95 theses, the great counter-reformation of the Roman Catholic religion. Now, what year are we talking about here? We're talking uh, roughly the middle of the 16th century, 1550 onwards to mm -hmm. the first part of the 17th century, where the Catholic Church struck back and uh, had the power and the authority, the will, the might, the armies, to uh, not only suppress Protestantism, mm -hmm. but to annihilate it in some countries. I'm thinking of the slaughter of the French Huguenots. In France, and, yeah. In, in France. France. Uh, the constant warfare between uh, heads of state who favored the Catholic religion versus heads of state who favored the Protestant uh, religion. This now, reminds me I, of the destruction of the Spanish Armada. I think they were trying to invade England for the purpose of reinstituting Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Is that correct yes. or not? Yes, this is a part and parcel of the political intrigue that surrounded heads of state who would use and manipulate uh, religious purposes. Now, of course, we are, we're not as concerned with the historical uh, political intrigue as we are with the doctrinal affirmations exactly. and the theology and the, uh, the, uh, the truth of the Word of God. For uh, we openly confess that not only uh, the Catholic religion, but also those who claim to be Protestants misused and abused the power of the state one against the other. The real issue here is not so much a political issue as, as a, a religious truth issue. Mm -hmm. Which religion speaks for God and Christ? Which system best represents that which Christ came and delivered to us for the salvation of mankind? This must be our issue, for both sides can claim political intrigue and political massacre and mm -hmm. heads of state opting for one way or the other, and the admixture of church and state is regrettable. Mm -hmm. But now, in our nation and indeed the world, the issues of the Reformation uh, are very much with us insofar as the truth of the, of the veracity of God's Word when it comes to salvation. So we're talking about uh, getting at God's truth as revealed in His Scripture rather than trying to force somebody to believe what you say at the end of a sword. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. In fact, and as you say that, when you consider uh, many Protestant scholars would trace the origin of the Roman Catholic Church as we know it today back to uh, a king who tried to force his people into believing into his religion. And this mm -hmm. would, of course, be Constantine in the Roman Empire at the point of sword or by edict or by decree to mm -hmm. make the people believe with him. And this cannot be done. Right. One must be born of the Spirit of God, not pressed by the sword of man into right. the kingdom. What does Zechariah 6, 4 say? Uh, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord? Yes, yes, <laughs> his spirit, exactly. Uh, and that's that, the issue before us. Exactly. So what I'd like to do now is kind of move into some of the material that we've prepared for in this video series. Uh, we're going to do several shows here. There's just too much to talk about to uh, get it all in one show. I want to uh, point out three, three distinctions here. First is Old Testament Judaism. Okay, this is the way it was set up in the Old Testament under Jewish law and what had to take place under the way it was uh, organized at that time before Christ's coming. Okay, the second category here in the red is New Testament Christianity. What does the New Testament say about what Christianity is on different topics? And we'll go right down the line. And of course, the third topic here in the green is Roman Catholicism. And then what the Church of Rome says on key issues. 
And so what I'm going to bring out now is point number one, and we'll just go right down the list and analyze these things as we get a brief overview as to the differences, as me and Robert are going to try to point out in this video series, between uh, Catholicism and New Testament Christianity. Okay, now we go over here, point number one. Under the Old Testament uh, Mosaic laws, you had what's called the high priest. And even in Jesus' day, you had Caiaphas was the high priest. He was kind of the head honcho. All the religious guys went to him. And uh, he was the overseer and went into the temple to offer sacrifice you know, once a year and, and other uh, holy days. But when we come to the New Testament, we find that, according to the book of Hebrews, protect, I'm particularly thinking of Hebrews chapter 7, we find that the, our high priest now in the New Testament is Christ himself, okay? And uh, I think the scriptures are, are pretty adamant about that. But when we go over here to Roman Catholicism, who do we find as the head honcho? As I was saying before about the high priest, and here the, our high priest now is Christ, but in Roman Catholicism, the vicar of Christ, the head of the church, the, the, the man that's in charge is the pope. And so what I see is a correlation in between Roman Catholicism and Old Testament Judaism. Just as Judaism had a high priest, the high priest of Roman Catholicism is the Pope. In fact, uh, it's interesting, if you look at a picture of a high priest in the Old Testament, I, I think they have one of these big long hats or something mm -hmm. like that. And then when you think, you put in your mind an image of the Pope, you, you know, you get the same kind of deal with uh, the robes and all the rest. But, uh, what I'm, seeing, what I'm seeing here then is not Christ himself here in Roman Catholicism, but the Pope, a man. Just like in Judaism, it was a man. Mm -hmm. Okay, we go to part two. We see here in, in the way the Jews had it set up in the Old Testament, they had a priesthood. They had priests that sacrificed animals, goats, bulls, whatnot, mm -hmm. doves, uh, for atonement of sins. And when we come to the New Testament, I think it's in uh, Revelation, isn't it? Chapter 1 or somewhere in there, it says that uh, all believers are a priesthood unto God. 1 Peter 2, uh, I think. 1 Peter 2. Right. Uh, the, the New Testament says that all believers are priests mm -hmm. unto God. You don't, and we don't need to wear special garb or anything and, mm -hmm. and absolve people from their sins. The Scripture make it clear that all true believers in Christ are priests unto God. But now when we come to Roman Catholicism, it's not everybody. It's just certain men are ordained as priests just like they used to do it in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Point three, they had a temple where they'd sacrifice, you know, for atonement of sins. They'd kill the animals and whatnot. We come to the New Testament, we find that the our, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. God himself resides in his people. They're living stones. I think that's in 1 Peter 2, 5. Mm -hmm. It says that we're uh, living uh, stones. With Christ is our, our chief cornerstone and stuff like that. So the, the, the temple of God basically is in his, his believers. Mm -hmm. But over here in Roman Catholicism, you have almost a counterpoint to Old Testament Judaism. The temple here in, in Roman Catholicism is the cathedral. Found it an interesting correlation. I might interject at this point that in these first three, the Old Testament Judaism was an access religion. The way to God was through the priesthood. The access to God was through the priesthood. The New Testament religion, biblical Christianity, is direct access, not through, not through, not through but right to Christ, every believer and the body of believers form the cathedral or the temple of Christ. In the Romanistic religion, it's still very much an access religion. The only reason they have the Pope as the vicar of Christ on earth and then the priesthood and the main cathedral at Rome is because they still believe in an access system to God. And you must go through this system because the Roman Catholic religion sincerely believes that 
God through Christ delivered a system of access to him, just like in the old covenant, he gave the nation of Israel an access through the priesthood to him. Now, of course, we believe that Christ fulfilled all the types by himself and that there's no more priesthood, there's no more high priest, there's no more temple ceremonies to God. The access to him has been replaced by a direct relationship with Jesus Christ. So you're very, very accurate here in seeing that this is a, a, an aspect of the Old Testament way to approach God that is mimicked by the Roman Catholic religion. Yes, and speaking of that, we come to point four of the holy city. Under Rome, or under Roman Catholicism, you have the holy city, here being Jerusalem in the Old Testament, and Roman Catholicism being Rome. I mean, it's once again a parallel as we go through these, uh, these parallels. But here in, in New Testament Christianity on point four, there's no physical city. What you find in John 4, verses 21 through 24, is that you don't need to worship on this mountain or that mountain or this city or that city. God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so you don't need to be here or there or the other place. I think even Jesus said, where two or more of you are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. There, uh, God can hear you wherever you are. You don't need to go to the Pope, the priest, the cathedral, or Rome to have access to God, which brings back into your point. Point five now, under Old Testament Judaism, you had a passive laity. You know, the, basically they sat there and watched while, while the priest did all the stuff up in front. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of sit around and... And, and, and take in the show, you might say. Well, we get the same, we get an interesting parallel over here in Roman Catholicism. You have a passive laity. They're sitting in the pews, they're, they're watching the show. And uh, what we get in, uh, in, uh, in the New Testament, and I just quoted that passage a minute ago, 1 Peter 2 5, mm -hmm. about the lively stones, and, and you got plenty of other passages where believers are different parts of the overall body, accomplishing different uh, functions of the body. But all believers are active. They're doing something for, for God. They're out there accomplishing something for the Christian faith. Okay, so uh, now that's not to say every Protestant church does that. <laughs> I've been in some awful dead Protestant churches mm -hmm. that uh, look more like uh, some of these other things we're discussing rather than uh, what the New Testament describes as a true believing church. Okay, so uh, I want to escape that straw man right away. <laughs> Point six. We have, in the Old Testament Judaism, of course, they got the Mosaic Law. They've got to do all these works and keep these commandments and, and mm -hmm. these holy days. And, and uh, you know, you got to scrape the mildew off at a certain time of year and you got to accomplish all these things. You're laboring under the law of Moses. And there's all these do's and don'ts and punishments and so whatnot. And, uh, and what we come over to here in Roman Catholicism is the same kind of deal with laws and things of do's and don'ts. We have something called the sacraments. And uh, I'll let you uh, talk a little more on that, Rob. You've got sacraments. Are, is there seven of them? Is seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. I want to point out here uh, for, the, for the audience at home that the Roman Catholic religion has a number of foundational pillars. The first foundational pillar, in my mind, is their understanding of the authority of the church to dispense salvation through the sacramental system. Very much like the Old Covenant, Old Testament, Pharisaical Judaism system where they built a hedge around the law of God to protect the law of God and then drew their people into their own laws and misused and abused the law of God. Thus you have the New Testament counterpart to it, the sacramental system of the Roman Catholic Church. All this is designed to prove the point that, that the Catholic religion is founded on the idea that Christ came and left a system behind for us or you or anybody to go through in order to have a relationship with God. I just cannot emphasize this enough because Catholics believe we are saved by grace and faith. But their understanding of grace and faith is that grace comes through the system. It comes through the sacramental system. When a Protestant says we're saved by grace, we believe that it's grace that comes directly to us from God 
through no merit, through no system, simply as a gift. It comes directly. It's nothing that we do. God pours it forth by virtue of the death of Christ and in his own willingness to show favor upon people. But in the Catholic system, it's all a sacramental system, going back to the passive laity. The, the people in the pews have something performed to them and onto them as they march their way through a system of sacraments. And uh, the, the Catholic theologian would cringe in his chair if we accused him of saying that you labor under the law just like the Pharisees labored under the law. He would reject that. He would say, no, we don't labor under the law. We know that the law is fulfilled in Christ. What we do labor under is what Christ has left us to labor under. And in that sense, the Roman Catholic theologian would say, we are obeying Jesus Christ by following through the sacraments he left with us. Now, the biblical Christian perspective comes along and says, no, Christ did not leave us a system. Christ left us himself. Direct access to the Father by a relationship with him. He did not ask us to labor under a new covenant codified set of system and standards which ultimately merit our salvation. Rather, he left us with Jesus Christ and asked us to trust him and him alone. And therein lies the difference. For the Catholics believe in grace, but it's through a system. Catholics believe in faith, but it's through a system. The biblical Christian position is there is no system it's a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we must emphasize over and over again. Yes, and it's not of works, lest any man should boast. That's correct. Not of works, not of works, <laughs> lest any man should boast. Just remember that. <laughs> of not of works. Of course, a Catholic theologian would say these are not works. Right. These are obediences that Christ has asked us to perform. And we would say, no, these are merit and these are works that you're presenting before God because Christ did not give us this system. This is your system that you have forced upon the scriptures. You haven't drawn it from the scriptures. And we'll try to show more of that right, later. Right, right. Very well said. And of course, just to reemphasize, you are saved by grace and by grace alone through faith in faith alone and Christ alone. Right. <laughs> to get all those alones in there. The solas of the Reformation. <laughs> there, you go, there you go. The solas of the Reformation. Uh, okay, now on to point number seven. A lot, of, and some of this, this goes back into history and stuff. Uh, you had the church and the state, a lot of times were combined into a, a one entity, like you had a theocratic system set up under the, you know, before they had a king, and a lot of times, even then, after they had a king, it was so combined in with the religious aspects of life that it was just uh, all kind of melded together in, a, in, a, in, in this kind of system. Church and state are one. And then we come over here to Roman Catholicism, especially going back into Catholic history. Many times, I think, the, and you can elaborate a little on this if you like, Rob, uh, the Catholic popes sometimes had more authority than the kings, and it could actually impose things on the civil governments and... Would you like to say anything about, about this uh, combining of church and state? Well, I, I would like to just point out that this uh, combination of church and state is dangerous no matter who is involved in it. In Europe today, there are so-called Protestant states who have a state religion, and there are so-called Catholic states that have a state religion. I would say that either side which promotes this type of commingling has made a great and grievous error. The Roman Catholic religion historically has been so dominant and so strong in the states where the adherence to the Catholic religion is almost 100%, 90, 95%, that there has been a melding of authority between church and state. And, uh, the Protestants must be very careful when uh, pointing a finger at this because we too have seen historically that whenever you combine the church and the state together and persecute those who don't hold to the same religion as you, you've made a grievous error. 
So I would caution this both to the Protestant and to the Catholic community and direct our attention to this, that the nature of biblical Christianity is that each person is saved individually by virtue of the power of God and that when he is saved, he is saved into the body of Christ and he remains, as Luther called it, uh, a kingdom within a kingdom, the kingdom of Christ within the state that the Christian resides. And his first obedience is to the Lord Jesus Christ and his second is to the state in which he resides. The great thing about the United States of America is that we have, we have determined a separation between church and state. And uh, more and more we see that very freedom eroded by statists who push and push and push the state into religious sphere. And we must remember that whenever the two are commingled, persecution results and uh, the faith of the people is denied. And the Catholic Church certainly is guilty of this in history and perhaps even today in some of the stronger Catholic nations and I say that in all sincerity because there's a Catholic domination of these nations who uh, are by virtue of their sacrament of baptism incorporating people into the Catholic Church who are also born into that particular state. And uh, they are failing to understand that God calls each man and woman, each person individually into his body. Excellent. All right, let's move on to point number eight. In the Old Testament, under the Ju Judaism uh, system they had, uh, you had punishment unto death, where if they found a witch, they could stone you to death, adultery, uh, blasphemy. There was uh, several penalties working on a Sabbath. You could be killed for that. Mm -hmm. And then once again, and I'll let you talk some more on this also to uh, clean up any fine points. On uh, point eight, in the Roman Catholic Church, particularly, and we touched on a little in past history, now, I don't know if it's so much prominent anymore, but uh, we go back to the Inquisition, you know, uh, the Thirty Years' War we were talking about earlier. You have punishment unto death. You can read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, in there you find a lot of martyrs killed for no other reason than they believed in Christ or they'd read a Bible. And because mm -hmm. that went against the church-state setup, they were killed for their faith. You know, uh, would you care to say anything about this? Yes, I think that the the Catholic Church has been guilty of this and reluctantly they admit to it. And their history is checkered with the so-called vow of the protection of the church in that they have usurped the authority of God by saying that those who disobey the Roman Catholic teachings are subject to being called heretical. And because they are heretics, they're deserving of punishment and the state will inflict the punishment on them. And this goes back to the commingling of church and state. The Catholic religion, when left unleashed in its uh, early form during the 17th, 16th century, felt that because they represented the word of God on, church, on the earth, that they had the right and the authority to put to death anybody who disagreed with them. And this is well documented in church history that the Catholic Church took full advantage of this. And this is part and parcel of the Crusades also, which took place for the liberation of the Holy Land, which was a ruse by the Roman Catholic religion to raise money for the coffers of the Vatican. Now this commingling of church and state leads to this type of uh, antagonistic relationship that the Roman Catholic religion has with other religions. We don't see this so much today. However, missionaries are now reporting in that the strongest uh, uh, resistance to the Protestant biblical Christian position is coming from the Roman Catholic religion in third world countries and it's a cause for concern. Although post-Vatican II terminology would deny all this, I think in practical reality, the Roman Catholic religion still holds to the authority to punish those who do not obey what they call the religion that Christ gave to us. Although it's not as widespread and certainly not in this nation is it an issue. 
Very well said. Uh, as we said, the New Testament Christianity on this point, it's non-carnal. You don't use weapons, the swords, as we mentioned before, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual for the pulling down of strongholds, stuff like that. Uh, I noticed here, <laughs> I quoted Zechariah 6, 4 earlier, but it should have been 4, 6. Uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, not by might, not, not by power, power but right. by the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, so uh, all you viewers out there, I apologize for uh, mixing up those, uh, that verse there. So when you look in your Bible and get all frustrated, uh, now you know why. <laughs> Can I just interject one thing here? Yes, go ahead. I want to make sure that if there are Roman Catholics uh, who are going to be watching this video, you know, our Roman Catholic theologians, priests, uh, lay people, that you will understand that we freely admit, at least I do, that the Protestant community has been guilty of some of the same types of uh, oppression and persecution exactly. that runs contrary to this non-carnal, non-violent uh, way of thinking that's given to us in the New Testament. Uh, we cringe at the thought of the Puritans leaving England due to the persecution of the Roman Catholic religion upon them, establishing a colony in Massachusetts and immediately running off Roger Williams to Rhode Island because he disagreed with them. We understand that our history, too, is checkered with this type of statist church commingling that really has nothing to do with the gospel of Christ because you cannot protect the gospel with the sword. And we're not saying that. What we are saying is that the sword was the protection of the theocracy of Israel, and in history it has been used by the Roman Catholic religion and on some occasions by those who deny Romanism as a method of enforcing a, a religion. So I'm not trying to build a straw man here uh, that, that we're blowing away. We understand the air exists on both sides, but we are exposing here the elements of Judaism that are very similar to the elements of Roman Catholicism, a system to reach God that runs contrary to the simplicity of the biblical record. Right. It's not that Protestants have not violated the same thing you were just mentioning. But we're, what this is pointing out is this is the New Testament uh, precedent. This is what it's saying to do, not saying exactly. that Protestants haven't messed up there themselves exactly. in that case. Okay. But I don't recall, uh, uh, of course, this, this may be construed as a cheap shot. I hope you don't mind. But I don't recall the Protestants organizing crusades uh, in the name of God to go attack foreign lands. But uh, there are, have been wars and a lot of mistakes by Protestants, and of course the uh, Roman Catholic apologists have every right to bring those up. So with that said, we'd simply point out what the, the New Testament is stating on this point. Okay, as we move along, as time flies, and it's flying very quickly, uh, point number nine. In Old Testament Judaism, you had a lot of the extra amenities or whatever you want to call it, the extra articles in worship. Mm -hmm. You had candles. You had altars in different places. You had incense, special robes and garbs and hats worn by the priesthood that set them apart. I guess it was the Le Levitical tribe mm -hmm. that was set apart to do these things and had all these trappings. Mm -hmm. Well, when we come over here to Roman Catholicism, we find the same kind of trappings that we found in Old Testament Judaism. You find the candles, mm -hmm. the altars, the incense, smoke, you know, robes, tall hats, and all the other things, I guess bells. There's, there's just all kinds of things that you could consider as trappings in this uh, particular situation. Would you care to elaborate any more on this particular Right. Topic? Well, it makes sense to me to to see this comparison because the Roman Catholic religion, as we have stated before, believes in an access to God through a system. And uh, to have that system, you must have leaders. Their leaders are their priests and the bishops and the cardinals and ultimately the pope himself. To have a system to funnel people through in order to have access to God, you would naturally develop over the years a number of uh, outstanding characteristics to that system. And as uh, the Roman Catholic Church piles up tradition next to the scriptures and piles up their uh, history, then some of these things come into uh, play, such as 
the uh, candles and the incense and the priestly garb which uh, has over the uh, years been added uh, by the Roman Catholic uh, religion to separate their priests from their laymen and so forth. I think the critical issue here will, when we come to it in, in number 10 will be the, the altar. For the altar in the old covenant under the system that God left for the nation of Israel was very, very important for the blood sacrifices. And of course, we know that those blood sacrifices were typological of the sacrifice which was to come. But nevertheless, the nation of Israel was responsible for performing the sacrificial system in anticipation of Messiah coming. So the altar was very much a part of the religious cult of the nation of Israel, and rightfully so. This was a commandment of God. But now that Christ has come, we would expect to see the altar disappearing, and it does in biblical Christianity, but yet it remains in the Roman Catholic religion because they have substituted the Old Testament altar for the sacrifice of animals, for the appeasement of God, the propitiation of God, and the expiation of sin with a new covenant altar, which is the uh, altar of the mass, which we will uh, be coming to shortly. Yes, and just to reiterate here on New Testament Christianity, of course, the answer is no to all these kind of trappings. In Hebrews 8, 6 through 13, you find uh, many things about a new covenant. In fact, in uh, Hebrews 8, 13, it says, In that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth, wax, <laughs> this King James is hard to pronounce sometimes, <laughs> now waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So you've got a new covenant. This old stuff is now ready to vanish away because we've got the new, but yet I find the old stuff being brought back up again, I guess resurrected. In, in, is a way to put it. Uh, but with that said, let's move on to something that's going to take us into a whole other range of discussion here. Exactly. Let me uh, set my Bible down. Okay, point 10. In Old Testament Judaism, you had a very important function of their religion, which was sacrifices. You can go to Leviticus 16 to make up for their sins, to atone for those sins, they had to sacrifice animals and it had to be blood sacrifices. And in Leviticus 16, for instance, it does say without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. You have to have uh, remission of sins by some kind of death of an animal. The blood has to flow. These altars you were just talking about, they had uh, uh, little channels cut into the stone where the blood just flowed. And uh, the smoke of the altars and, and, and the flowing blood would last, you know, literally without ceasing almost because the sins only, you, you would make a sacrifice and it would atone for your sins that day. Mm. But if you left and you, you committed another sin a, a day or two later or whatever, suddenly you had to go back and get another sacrifice to get mm. those sins covered. Right. And we come over here to the, the Roman Catholic Mass and we find that it's, a, it's, it's Leviticus 16 in another way. It's, it's a, a sacrifice this time being instituted day after day. I think somewhere every, every day, uh, every four minutes, Roman Catholic Mass is taking place somewhere in the world, and they're mm -hmm. sacrificing Christ again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Well, our time is almost up now. Of course, uh, as we get in the New Testament, Christ is our sacrifice. I want to just say, uh, as our time is flown by, Rob. There's no more time to continue. We will, this is only part one of this series. We will pick up with the Mass and move on into a vast array of different subjects on Roman Catholicism. If any of you out there are interested, uh, you can contact Roman, uh, not Roman Catholicism, contact Dayspring Evangelism at the number that will appear on your screen. Also, Rob Zenz's address and phone number and all that material uh, will be at the end of the show. So please contact or call us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob, for being with us. We're looking forward My to the pleasure. next show where we can pick up on this where we left off. Thank you. For other shows in this 16-hour series on the religion of Roman Catholicism, please type the following words in the YouTube search box, Larry Wessel's Roman Catholicism. Other shows in this series include the Roman Mass, Roman Catholic Inventions, 
Vatican II, Roman Doctrine of Mary, Purgatory, Roman Doctrine of the Pope, Roman Catholic Apologists, Scripture Twisting, the Roman Priesthood, Roman Style Universalism, and others. Besides this series, Christian Answers also has various debates with Roman Catholic spokesmen such as Does Romanism Preach Another Gospel Debate, Debate with a Monsignor, Indulgences Debate, Virgin Mary Debate, Papal Infallibility Debate, and several others. Remember to gain free access to all these video presentations simply by typing Larry Wessels, Roman Catholicism, in the YouTube search box. Thank you. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 